Welcome back for another summer blockbuster. This summer, I'm going behind the scenes to some of the biggest summer blockbuster movies. If you're new here, welcome. Each week, I create a new look using Color Street nail strips, and this summer, join me and go behind the scenes to see how these movies were made. If you're interested in unique color combos and want to learn some movie magic facts, I would highly recommend that you hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. This past weekend, we celebrated America's 245th birthday. And today, along with this American Dream Manny, we're gonna uncover the secrets of the 1996 hit, Independence Day. This sci-fi summer blockbuster was directed by Ronald Emmerich and produced by Dean Devlin. But these two didn't just direct and produce the film, they wrote it. Ronald Emmerich was born in West Germany in 1955, and during his youth, he traveled throughout Europe and North America. In 1977, he began attending the University of Television and Film in Munich, with the intention of studying to become a production designer. But after watching Star Wars, he instead decided to enroll in the school's film director program. In 1994, along with Devlin, Emmerich directed and wrote the unexpected successful sci-fi film Stargate. While promoting the film in Europe, he came up with the idea for the film while answering a question about his own beliefs in existence of alien life. Emmerich stated he was still fascinated by the idea of an alien arrival and further explained his response by asking the reporter to imagine what it would be like to wake up in the morning and discover a 15 mile wide spaceship were hovering over the world's largest cities. Emmerich then turned to his production partner and said, I think we have an idea for our next film. Emmerich and Devlin decided to, ex to expand on the idea by incorporating a large scale attack and Emmerich agreed by asking Devlin, if arriving from across the galaxy, would you hide on a farm or would you make a big entrance? The two wrote the script during a month-long vacation in Mexico, and just one day after, they sent it out for consideration. 20th Century Fox chairman Peter Turnlin greenlighted the screenplay, and pre-production began three days later in February of 1995. The U.S. military originally intended to provide personnel, vehicles, and costumes for the film. However, they backed out when producers refused to remove the script's Area 51 references. A then record 3,000 plus sci-fi effects shots were ultimately required for the film. The shoot utilized an on-set, in-camera special effects more than computer-generated effects in the effort to save money and to get more authentic pyrotechnic results. Many of the shots were accomplished at the Hughes Aircraft in Culver City, California where the film arts department, motion control photography teams, pyrotechnic team, and model shops were headquartered. The production's model making department built more than twice as many miniatures for the production than they've ever built for another film. By creating miniatures of the buildings, streets, aircrafts, landmarks, and monuments. The crew also built miniatures of several spaceships featured in the film including a 30-foot destroyer model and a version of the mothership spanning 12 feet. City streets were recreated then tiled upright beneath a high-speed camera mounted on the scaffolding, filming downwards. An explosion would be ignited below the model and the flames would rise towards the camera, engulfing the tiled model to create a rolling wall of destruction. A model of the White House was created covering 10 feet by 5 feet and was used with forced perspective shots before being destroyed in a similar fashion for the destruction scene. This all took a week to plan out and required 40 explosive charges. The film's aliens were designed by production designer Patrick Bolas. The actual aliens in the film were based on design that he drew up when tasked with Emmerich to create an alien that was both familiar and completely original. These creatures wore a biomechanical suit and they were 8 feet tall, equipped with 25 tentacles, purposely designed to show it could not sustain the person inside, so it would not appear to be a man in a suit. In July 1995, a second unit gathered for establishing shots of Manhattan, Washington, D.C., and an RV community in Flagstaff, Arizona. The White House interior sets used had already been built for the American president, 
and previously used for Nixon. The production moved to Wendover, Utah and West Wendover, Nevada, where the deserts doubled as Imperial Valley and the Wendover Airport doubled as El Toro and Air 51 exteriors. It is here where Pullman filmed his battle speech. The cast of the film was really star-studded. Will Smith was cast as Captain Stephen Hiller, and Emerge and Devlin specifically wanted Smith after seeing his performance at Six Degrees of Separation. Bill Pullman was cast as President Thomas J. Whitmore. For the First Lady, Marilyn Whitmore, Mary McDonald was cast. Jeff Goldblum was chosen for the MIT educated satellite engineer David Levinson. Jude Hirsch was cast as Julius Levinson, David's father, and this character was based off of Devlin's uncles. Randy Quaid was cast as Russell Case, was intentionally depicted to be rejected as a volunteer of the July 4th aerial counteroffensive because of his alcoholism. But he instead stole a missile, tied it to his biplane, and carried out the suicide mission. Though it was well received with test audiences, the scene was reshot as we see it in the film. Devil preferred the alternative scene because he felt like seeing a biplane keeping up the pace with flying along FAA-18s was unbelievable. Brent Spiner was also cast as Dr. Oaken, the scientist in charge of Area 51. His unkempt appearance was very different than we're used to seeing him as Data on Star Trek The Next Generation. We all know where the speech was filmed now, but how was this epic speech developed? A number of films and a number of performances have delivered audiences countless impressive and inspiring monologues over the years, but there arguably has not been a speech that tops the impact of Bill Pullman's delivering an address as President Whitmore to inspire courage among humanity's last hope. Between the script, performance, and overall execution, one would think that it was a difficult task to find the specific choice of words to instill hope not only in its characters but also in its audience. But come to find out, Hemorrhage said that the scene only took a few minutes to write and the initial dialogue was never changed. The only exception was right before filming the scene, Devlin and Pullman decided to add, today we celebrate our Independence Day at the end of the speech. At the time, the production was nicknamed ID4 because Warner Brothers owned the right to the title of Independence Day in 1983 film. Pullman has stated in a 2020 interview that Fox had otherwise been aiming to use Doomsday for the film to match the other disaster films of the time. But Devlin and Emmerich had hoped the impact of the speech scene would help win Fox over to the Independence name. The right to use the title was eventually won two weeks later. For years after the film, Pullman said so many times over the years, people said, do you want to do the speech? We've got a funny version of it. You could deliver it. But he generally avoided such overtures for fear of violating or diluting the original speech. He did end up making two exceptions in recent history. One for a Super Bowl commercial in, in 2016, same year the sequel Independence Day Resurgence came out. And the second one was this year for 4th of July weekend. Pullman declined at first, but Emmerich and Devlin provided their blessings. The Grammy award-winning score for the film was composed by David Arnold and recorded with an orchestra of 90 and a choir of 46, and every last ounce of stereotypical Americana he could muster for the occasion. Devlin commented that you can leave it up to a Brit to write some of the most arousing and patriotic music in history of American cinema. When the film was still in post-production, Fox began a massive marketing campaign to help promote the film, beginning with the airings of a dramatic commercial during Super Bowl XXX, which it paid $3. million. The film's success in the box office resulted in a trend of using Super Bowl airtime to kick off the advertising campaign for potential blockbusters. Fox's licensing and merchandising division also announced a co-promotional deal with Apple Inc. The co-marketing project was dubbed the Power to Save the World campaign, in which the company used footage of David using his PowerBook laptop in their print and television ads. The film was marketed with several taglines, including 
we've always believed we weren't alone, on July 4th, we'll wish we were. Or Earth, take a good look. It could be your last. And don't make plans for August. The weekend before the film was released, the Fox Network aired a half an hour special on the film. The first third of which was a spoof news report on the events that happened in the film. Roger Ebert attributed most of the film's early success to its teaser trailers and marketing campaigns, acknowledging them as truly brilliant. The film was officially completed on June 20th, 1996, five days before it was scheduled for the Man Plaza premiere. Then, on July 3rd, 1996, the film was released worldwide, but began showing on July 2nd, the same day the film story begins, in limited release as a result of high-level anticipation among moviegoers. The film received mixed to positive reviews, who criticized characters but praised the performances and visuals. Independence Day was the highest grossing film of 1996, beating out other blockbusters of the year such as Twister, Scream, Space Jam, Mission Impossible, and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. In the United States and Canada, it turned $104.3 million in the opening week, including $96 million during the five-day holiday weekend. All three figures broke records set by Jurassic Park three years earlier. Independence Day stayed in the number one spot for three consecutive weeks and grossed $306 million in the U.S. and Canada. The combined worldwide total was over $817 million. It came second only to the worldwide earnings of Jurassic Park as the highest of all time. Hoping to capitalize on the film's success, several studios released large-scale disaster films and an already rising interest in science fiction-related media was further increased by the film's popularity. A month after the film's release, jewelry designers and marketing consultants reported an increased interest in dolphin-themed jewelry as the character Jasmine, played by Vivica A. Fox, wore dolphin earrings and presented with a wedding ring featuring a golden dolphin. Now considered a significant turning point in history for the Hollywood blockbuster, Independence Day was in the forefront of the large-scale disaster film and sci-fi resurgence of the mid-late 90s. The film won an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects and was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Sound. Disaster elements portrayed in Independence Day represented a significant turning point for Hollywood blockbuster films, with advancement in CGI effects, event depicting mass destruction became a commonplace in films that soon followed, such as Volcano in 97, Armageddon in Deep, and Deep Impact in 1998. The trend continued through the 2000s and 2010s. Evidence in film, such as two of Emmerich's films, Day After Tomorrow in 04 and 2012, released in 2009. As well as other blockbusters like Titanic, Transformers, and the Avengers. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Hope you enjoyed this look and just groundbreaking disaster film, Independence Day. God bless America, and we'll see you for the next one.